Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one-player game, Proving Grounds, designed by Kane Klenko and published by Renegade Game Studios, who helped sponsor this video. A group of conspirators have framed you for the death of your mother to keep you from taking your rightful place on the throne. Your only chance now is to survive trial by combat and prove your innocence. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, assemble and place this encounter board on the table in front of you, and then find the cards with this back. These make up the enemy deck, which you'll shuffle, and place face down nearby. Then, one at a time, as I'm doing here, you'll draw and place one card face up into each of these six spaces surrounding our hero, Maya. Each enemy now has one of these battle markers placed into the gray outlined space of the track found on their right side. Over here you'll find Maya's health track, and you'll place this health marker into the top left space, and then stack a green, yellow, and blue die onto the space showing a multicolored ring. This area over here is the exhaustion track, and you'll place a single white die into each of its spaces. In all of these cases though, the values showing face up on the dice don't matter. Nearby, set one green, one yellow, one blue, and five white dice in an area known as your dice pool. The rest of the components can just be returned to the box. These are optional modules that you can use to increase the variety and difficulty as you play, and we'll talk about them later. But for now, we're just setting up the core game known as the training game. You should also get the Renegade Games Companion app or any one minute timer. But if you do have the app to complete the setup, tap here on Proving Grounds and after it loads, you'll tap here on the Training Game button. And that's the setup. In Proving Grounds, you'll be taking on the role of Maya Strongheart, who's in a fight for justice and for her own life. The game even comes with this illustrated short story that will give you the background on how you ended up in this position, accused of murder, and surrounded by your enemies who are plotting your demise. The game is played over a series of rounds, and each round is broken into three steps, starting with rolling dice. First, tap the button here on the app to start the timer. Now, if you don't have the app, that's okay. Any one minute timer will do. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to pause the timer, but normally you would have at most 60 seconds to complete this step. And once that timer starts, you'll immediately grab all of the dice in your dice pool and roll them. After this initial roll, you'll separate the dice, either physically, like I'm doing here, or even just mentally, into groups of matching numbers. Any dice that don't match the value of any other die rolled is known as a single and cannot be re-rolled. In this case, we have three singles, a one, a three, and a four. Now, any group of dice that share the same value with each other are known as a set. And sets can always be re-rolled, but you must re-roll only one set at a time if you choose to do that. For example, I may choose to re-roll these twos. And let's say after doing that, I had a three and a six. Well, after this re-roll, I would then resort my dice. And you'll notice, because of this, I've now created a new set of threes when I only had a single three before. Now that this has become a set, I can choose to re-roll it if I want to. Or I could re-roll all of these sixes. And that's important because when you do choose to re-roll a set, you can't re-roll just a portion of it. You must re-roll the entire thing. We'll see in a moment why you would want to keep rolling dice to get different results. But now that you understand how it works, you'll continue rolling as often as you want to or are able until you're happy with the results, in which case you can just pause the timer. Or if the timer runs out, then you must stop rolling the dice. Either way, at that point, you move on to the next step known as resolving attacks. With your dice separated by their final values, now assign them to the matching numbered enemies based on the values shown beside them within this inner ring. So in other words, this is enemy number one, and we would place any ones we rolled beside it. Here we have enemy number two, so we'll place these twos here. And don't be surprised if some enemies don't receive any dice because you simply didn't roll any of those values. That said, each die represents an attack you are making against that enemy. And once dice are assigned, you'll resolve each attack in order, starting with enemy one. If your attack resulted in only a single die against the enemy, then the enemy has scored a hit on you, and you move their battle marker down one space. And this is why when you're performing your rolls, you may want to re-roll dice to try to eliminate any single results. 
Now, if you attack with a set that has a number of dice equal to or more than the number showing in the space directly above the battle marker, then you score to hit on this enemy and you move that marker up one space. For the sake of the next example, let's just say that we had rolled four fours against this enemy. If you assign enough dice to an enemy that it satisfies the requirements of a space and the dice left over would satisfy the next space as well, you can move the marker up again. Just note, you cannot use the same die more than once within the same attack. We couldn't now, for example, say, look, we've got another set of two fours right here, and we'll attack again. Those dice were already used, so you'd have to stop here. Sometimes a space requires that you have dice of a specific color within the set in order to score a hit. For example, here we'd need at least three dice, and one of them would have to be green. So in this case, we do satisfy that condition, and would score the hit. However, if your set does not have the required number or color of dice, you don't move the marker up or down. Remember, it's only if you've assigned a single die to an enemy that the marker would move down. As long as you have a set, then if you don't meet the minimum requirements for a hit, the marker just stays put. The enemy didn't score a hit, and you didn't either. In this case, though, we do have a successful set, so we'll move the marker up. Now, if you didn't assign any dice to an enemy, you don't attack them, and they don't hit you. The marker just stays where it is. However, in all of these situations, make sure you read the box here. This represents the enemy's ability, and it may change what happens. For example, this one says that you move this enemy's battle marker down one space if you didn't attack it. So where normally this marker would stay where it is when no dice are assigned to this enemy, in this case, the enemy scores a hit. After you've moved all of the markers, you now check to see if you defeated any enemies or received any wounds. For each battle marker that is on the bottom space of a battle track, you've suffered a wound, and for each wound you suffer, you'll follow three steps. First, add any one of your used dice to the top of this exhaustion track, and if there are dice already there, just stack them on top. Then, you'll move your health marker here down one space. This stack of dice is kind of blocking the track, but you can see it follows a pattern with these connected lines like this. So we would move this health marker here. Then you'll reset that enemy's battle marker to its start space. So here we would suffer another wound, meaning we need to remove another one of our dice, move our health marker, and reset the battle token. When suffering a wound, if it causes your health marker to go into the colored stack of dice here, then you get to replace any one of your white dice in your pool with any one of the dice in this stack. Just return the white die to the box. Then any remaining dice here are moved down one space on the track to make room for your health marker. And that means the next time you suffer a wound, you'll bump into the stack again and get to take one of these dice as well to replace one of your remaining white dice. Now that said, if your health marker ever reaches this last space, then you immediately lose. Although it didn't happen in this round, if a battle marker is on the top space of a track, you've defeated that enemy. Remove it from the encounter board and place it face up in a discard pile nearby. And if you've defeated eight enemies and are still alive at the end of this resolve attack step, you win the game. You've not only saved your own life, but in trial by combat, proved your innocence. You'll notice the app allows you to track how many enemies you've defeated. Simply adjust the value when you're prompted. Now, either way, if you haven't won or lost at the end of this second step, you'll move on to the third step of the round, known as recovery. First, return all dice assigned to enemies back to your dice pool. And then, on this exhaustion track, move all of the dice down one space. And any that left the bottom of the track, you'll then place into your dice pool. Now, for every empty spot around the encounter board, draw and place a single face-up enemy into it, putting a marker into its start space. And then you're ready for the next round, and you'll continue like this until you either win or lose the game. Now, what I've shown you here is known as the training or core rules. Once you're familiar with these, there are six modules you can add to the game in any combination to increase the difficulty and provide new ways to play. Now, we're not going to go through all six of these, as you'll want to introduce them at your own pace. But that said, let's go over the first module, known as the Dragonling, to give you a sense of how the game can change. With this module, a young dragon has appeared, which can assist Maya, but can also create chaos in the arena. 
During the setup, you'll add the dragging link die to your pool and set this token nearby, which has a rules reference on the back. When playing, during the roll dice step of each turn, you'll always roll the dragging link die as part of your initial roll. You may then re-roll the dragon die anytime you would re-roll a set, but you can never combine it with a single die to re-roll it because, as we know, single dice cannot be re-rolled. Once you've decided to stop rolling or the timer has run out, you'll determine how to use the dragon result based on the other dice that you rolled. If you see the talon, tail, or teeth, you may add the dragon die to any set or even single die to attack an enemy that has the same icon showing in its top left hand corner. So in this case, by assigning only a single die here, this enemy was going to hit me. But because it has this symbol, I can assign the dragon die here as well, which is not enough to move the marker up, but it also means it won't move down either. If instead I had added that dragon die to a set of threes, then this would count as the third die necessary to cause a hit and move this marker up. One thing to keep in mind is that the dragon does not count as a colored die and is considered white for the purposes of any color requirements. So although we have three dice here, we don't have any that are green, so this marker would not move up. If you get a wing, you can pick any enemy where you'd placed only a single die and then add it there. This will stop that marker from moving down. But the wing itself does not count as having created a set here. This still counts as only one die in terms of how much we've attacked the enemy. That means in this case, we don't have the required two dice necessary to move this marker up. Now, there's also a shield module that you can add in later. And if you're playing with that, then a wing result does not prevent a situation that would cause an enemy to raise their shield. That won't make a lot of sense right now, but once you understand the shield module, it will. The final type of result you might have is this chaos symbol. And if this is what you have once you stop rolling or once the timer runs out, then before you resolve any attacks, you must re-roll all of your non-white dice. And that's just one of the modules. There's also one to add chariots and their related cards, another that gives you special inspirational powers, another module adds shields which your enemies can use to defend themselves, Another one adds conspirators who will appear over time, potentially triggering their powers to work against you. And finally, we have the sun and moon module, which covers up the center of the encounter board and adds an element of paying attention to which way you are facing, giving bonuses for hitting enemies directly in front of you and penalties for those you don't hit who are in this position. If you want to play with the modules and you have the app, you can tap on the advanced game option and then pick the modules that you wish to use. Now you'll be able to tap on these modules and get a quick reminder of how their rules work in case you need a refresher. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Proving Grounds. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notifications anytime we post a new video. But until next episode, thanks for watching.